A major theme in the Gospels and Acts is Jesus as the promised Messiah of the Old Testament and his messianic kingdom presented to and rejected by Israel. All right, let's take a look at these passages that uh, summarize what I've uh, said in that statement. Matthew 4.17. As Jesus begins his public ministry, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Literally, the kingdom of heaven is has drawn near. It has come close. Well, what was the response to this claim by Jesus Christ that the kingdom had drawn near and that he was the king, he was the Messiah? Well, now go to the end of the Gospels to... John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 15. This is at the trial of Jesus. This is as he was before Pilate. And notice in verse 14, he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Israel, here's your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, Matthew 4, we see the beginning. The kingdom and the person of the king is drawn near. And each one of the Gospels is going to make it very, very clear that Jesus Christ was the the Messiah. He was Israel's promised king. That's going to be most prevalent in Matthew, but is also found in the other three Gospels as well, because it was true. It was reality. And we'll see how each one of the Gospels is going to show as Jesus came how first the leaders and then the people, led by the leaders, refuses and ex- uh, will not have Jesus rule over them, culminating in John chapter 19, where when Pilate says, here's your king, the people and the priests, the chief priests, renounce him and say, he's not our king. So the Gospels make it very, very clear that Jesus was the king, and yet as the king, he was rejected by Israel. They refused to repent, and they refused to to embrace Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And this continues in the book of Acts. Acts. That in the early chapters of the book of Acts, even after the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, that once again, the reality of Jesus as Messiah is presented to Israel. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Peter After Peter and John had been going to the temple and uh, Peter had to heal the the man lame from birth and a, a crowd gathers and Peter preaches and says in verse 17, and now brothers, I know you acted in ignorance as did your rulers. Why? Because Christ said on the cross, Luke 23, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. You acted in ignorance. That uh, basically upon the cross, Jesus, as it were, you know, said that uh, 
this, by and large, was not a willful sin of the Old Testament because they were doing it in ignorance. So I know you, you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So that even in the crucifixion, messianic prophecy had been fulfilled. And of course, immediately our minds go to passages, passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Those prophecies have been fulfilled. This was part of the plan of God. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. If you will repent and return to God, embracing Jesus as Messiah, your sins will be blotted out. And that will be the immediate consequence and the ultimate consequence of your acceptance of Jesus Messiah is that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for the restoring of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. That what has taken place with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ has not in any way changed God's ultimate plan to send Jesus as the Messiah to rule and reign. And so, God is going to fulfill the promises he has made by the mouth of the prophets long ago. And if you will embrace Jesus, if you, if you will reverse what took place previously as recorded in the Gospels, then, uh, then Jesus ultimately will come and establish his kingdom and you will be part of that reign. But what was Israel's response? Israel's response as shown through its leaders was the same post-cross as it was pre-cross. That when you get to Acts chapter 7 verses 51 to 60, by the way, Stephen, who was uh, not only saw the Lord, but also acted very Christ-like as well, full of the Holy Spirit, seeing the glory of God. Also, verse 60, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Which again gives us insight that God ultimately will forgive even the second rejection, as it were, of Jesus as the Messiah. But it's against that backdrop then that, uh, that the Lord will call Paul and ultimately the message will go to the Gentiles. But interestingly, even from Acts 13 all the way to Acts 28, not until first Israel has been given diaspora Jews who were not part of what took place in Palestine are... are are proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah and rejection, rejection, rejection all the way to Acts 28. And Paul's response in Acts 13 and Acts 28 is, because you reject it, we turn to the Gentiles. And uh, so um, um, this is essentially the major theme in the Gospels and Acts. Christ is the Messiah. Israel refuses to repent and respond. And uh, therefore, they are not saved and ultimately, as predicted by Christ, and then we see historically taking place, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Now, against this backdrop is very, very important because even though the kingdom is the major theme in the gospels and acts, we need to realize that uh, to... To enter the kingdom, one needs salvation. And the Gospels and Acts demonstrate that salvation is necessary for entrance into the kingdom that Jesus was presented. Repent. Unless there is a spiritual change, unless you recognize your sinful condition, separation from God, 
until you repent of your sins and turn and embrace Jesus as Messiah. As John records in the words that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus with his own commentary, verses 16 to 21 of John chapter 3, that for the most pious Jew, the chief teacher of Israel, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, unless you're born from above, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom without a new birth. And Nicodemus is mystified. How can these things be? And Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel. You don't know what I'm talking about? I mean, if I was giving you some kind of spiritually, heavenly, esoterical teaching you couldn't understand, that would be one thing. I'm talking about earthly things, and I'm talking about things revealed in the Old Testament, and you don't get it. And this is throughout the, the Gospels that ultimately sinners, even in Israel, need to recognize their sin, need to recognize the predicament they're in under the wrath of God, and they need to respond by being saved. That, that's the gospel, that's the good news. You know, proclaimed by John and then by Jesus. The good news is, Jesus is the king. And by repentance, you can be born from above. You can be saved and have the forgiveness of sins. And ultimately enter into that kingdom once established here upon the earth. Now, obviously... During this age, since one does not immediately enter into uh, the earthly kingdom, certainly in the letters what's going to be emphasized is the salvation that we've received in Jesus Christ. Uh, The fact that in Christ, through repentance and faith, there is the forgiveness of sins. And one is spiritually regenerated, born from above. And of course, from John chapter 3... Those of us who know that salvation in Jesus Christ will one day see and enter the kingdom when it's established here upon the earth. Uh, And I say that because obviously some will want to make, well, make E more important than D. But uh, but really in the reading, and I'll leave it to you, that uh, what comes out first and foremost is this message concerning the kingdom. And then as you understand the necessity of spiritual change, of salvation, a spiritual salvation for one to enter the kingdom, you can see how these two, these two points are very closely aligned together. Uh, but certainly the, the greater emphasis in the Gospels and Acts will be on point D as a foundation for understanding truly what is point E. As I said, when you get then to the letters, there's going to be a greater emphasis upon E, although still echoing in the background is uh, what I've listed there as D, the, the backdrop of Jesus being the Messiah and the one who uh, ultimately is going to establish God's rule upon the earth. All right, so here is the, the essential message of the Gospels. But right away, we then have to say, well, what is a gospel? I mean, why did these historical narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, how did they get the name gospel? Well, significantly in the early tradition of the church, they weren't called gospels. The earliest text just says, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. So in the second century, just the distinction was, these are four accounts, and to say which account it is, will We'll just uh, title it by the, the human author. It was only about the fourth century that the word gospel was added. Now, we think of gospel being a written account. But uh, gospel, in the New Testament, the term meant a spoken proclamation of good news. A heralding 
of salvation. So gospel, and, and interestingly, Mark, I believe, titles his book, The Beginning of the Gospel. The beginning of the proclamation. This is what pro, was proclaimed, and what was proclaimed, I'm writing down. So, uh, so a gospel, and particularly Mark, <laughs> think in terms of the fact that uh, Mark was written to be heralded. So, um, can I give you some insight on how to read particularly Mark and the other gospels? Go into a room and do it out loud. As John Piper says, you know, if you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear him speak audibly, read it out loud. Okay? Uh, if you want to, if you, particularly Mark, if, if you, Mark was written to be read, to be heard. And even in English translation, uh, you can catch things by the ear, you will not necessarily see with the eye. You'll, you'll get a, a sense of the tone of uh, the writing when you speak it out loud. By the way, also remember, even in English, the commas and the periods are there for a reason, to slow you down. By an exclamation point, is there for a reason, too. Raise your voice. Um, question marks are there too for a reason. Ask a question. All right, and 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 read it following those promptings, and uh, you you will you'll start to hear a sense of 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 the like I said the tone, the emotional tone, the atmosphere of the writing that you just don't get by reading it, you know, by sight. By the way, silent reading is only 500 years old, by the way. Uh, go to Jerusalem, go to the Western Wall today, and everybody is reading the Scripture out loud. They don't listen to anybody else, they're just reading it out loud. And uh, that's, that's the way the, uh, the rabbis do it to this day in, uh, in Judaism. And each of the four Gospels and Acts record historical events and words, I've already said that. Each uses the story style. And then a question I've been asked, I'm, I'm sure you've probably been asked it too, why did God give us four Gospels? Why don't we just have one? In fact, why don't we just call it one perfect life? <laughs> Which is good, but uh, it doesn't take the place, because I'm going to give you one perfect life, just in the, the next point very quickly. But why four Gospels? Well, each Gospel writer had a unique purpose and a unique audience for their narrative about Jesus Christ. Now, the Gospels are ultimately for all Christians. They're part of the canon. God didn't say, well, figure out who you are and then just read the gospel for you. But in the, the writing of the gospel, the Holy Spirit had a reason why each gospel was written in the way that it was. Now, you've got to realize it's the same Jesus, it's the same history, and that's what One Perfect Life and other harmonies seek to do is, okay, get behind the Gospels and see, all right, what is the history that underlies the, uh, the Gospel presentation, that is the written presentation. But why does this author choose this event and these words as opposed to another event with possibly another words or from a longer speech of Jesus chooses to say this that Jesus said instead of that or another gospel writer emphasizes something else. It's like you hear a sermon and, uh, uh, well, Dr. Lawson last night, an hour, I mean, some of you heard, I mean, you could say, well, he emphasizes, he em no, he talked about this. He th in other words, 
He talked about a number of things. And one individual could emphasize one thing he said, and another could emphasize another thing that he said. That's, that's what we have with the Gospels. So now, and of course, we, we let the early church fathers who were closest to the New Testament to give us some help, and yet as we, as we read the text, we, we realize that what they are saying about the text is true to what we read in the text themselves. That ultimately, we believe that the primary audience and the purpose is what it is because of what we read in the Gospels, the written accounts themselves. And there are four Gospels. Matthew came first. Now, Mark is second in our canon, but actually Luke was written second, then Mark, then John. And I've given you the dates there, and of course, they'll come back in the notes in the proper place. But take a look at to whom was Matthew first and foremost written? It was written for a Jewish audience. The more you think like a Jew, the more you'll better understand Matthew. Uh, let me give you, uh, you know, just one for instance. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Yeah, Matthew chapter 15. And uh, Matthew here at, uh, at this point talks about a conflict between Jesus and the scribes. Of course, they had a lot of conflicts, but here's one. 15.1, the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. What's all that all about? And he answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Now, having seen that, uh, turn over to Mark chapter 7. Now, Mark is writing for a Gentile audience. Now, how many of you know how to wash your hands properly before you eat? I've noticed some of you. Some of you don't wash your hands at all before you eat. <laughs> but then I don't necessarily either. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, look, there's good food there. I don't, I'm not going to go over the, I'm not going to go over to the drinking fountain over there. I mean, and get, you know, what, what are you supposed to do with that water? Is that there to wash your hands before you go over here and get dinner? So Mark 7 verse 1, now when the Pharisees gathered him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, up, oh, same of same situation Matthew was describing. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands but were defiled. That is unwashed. And then notice three and four. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly according to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Now, what do you understand by what Mark says here? His audience is not Jewish, is it? Why? Because he has to explain for his audience what the Jewish custom was. What's being spoken about? Why doesn't Matthew give you any explanation? Because everybody he's writing to knows they're Jews. They know what the tradition is. Mark explains it. So as I said, now, the church fathers tell us this. Matthew predominantly was written to a Jewish, Jewish audience. Mark to a Gentile audience. Well, read the text. Yeah, that's right. Now, what about Luke. Well, when we get there, we're going to find out it's addressed to a man named Theophilus. By the way, Theophilus is a Greek name, lover of God. It means lover of God, but he was an actual man. Most excellent. Probably a, in some way, tied into the Roman government. Don't know how, but the only other most excellence in Luke Acts are Roman governors. So he's a man of status, a man of status. A man of standing. 
Uh, and by the way, uh, Roman governors uh, weren't elected. Um, they were appointed because they were already rich. You know, politicians in the West, they get elected and get rich. In Rome, you are rich, and then, you know, they, they, they did civil, civic duty. And uh, Theophilus was such an individual who came to faith in Christ. And we'll see the same thing there, the explanation and emphasis upon Gentiles. And then when we get to, to John, we'll see once again the audience is predominantly Jewish. There are, there are so many things that John doesn't explain. I'm the true vine. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread come down from heaven. If you don't know the Old Testament, those are almost meaningless statements. So Matthew and John, their primary audience was Jewish. Mark and Luke, Gentile. But then take a look at the purpose. Now, John makes it very, very clear. These things are written, you might believe. So Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. He, he writes for an evangelistic purpose. That through his gospel, his Jewish audience might come to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, Mark calls his gospel a gospel, a proclamation of the good news, a beginning of the proclamation of the good news. And just as John is seeking to confront the Jewish non-believer with the reality of who Jesus is, Mark is doing the same with a Gentile audience. Now, in both cases, the purpose is evangelistic. Now, certainly you can read Mark, you can read John as believers, and there's a lot there to learn about Jesus Christ. So the purpose is evangelistic, but the result for a believer is certainly edification. But first and foremost, Mark and John, I think John more directly, written to Jewish uh, synagogue participants uh, concerning the reality of who Jesus was. So evangelistic. Now, for those who've come to faith in Christ, Matthew is didactic. That is teaching. And basically is teaching to give assurance to Jewish Christians that what they believed was true. And the same thing for Luke. Luke is writing to give assurance to Theophilus that the things that he was taught about Jesus are true. So Mark and John, they have the unbeliever ultimately in mind, first and foremost that I'm writing in such a way directed by the Holy Spirit that who Jesus is becomes clear for the Gentile and for the Jew that they might come to faith in Jesus as Savior, as Lord, i.e. as Messiah. Now for those who have believed, who are Jews, Matthew gives the assurance that truly Jesus was the Messiah. And uh, for Theophilus, a Gentile, Luke gives the assurance, not only that Jesus was the Messiah, but Jesus had already proclaimed and uh, prophesied that the message of salvation, the good news, would go from Jerusalem to all the Gentiles, to all the nations. And uh, that a Gentile did not have to become a Jew, be circumcised and follow the law, to truly be a Christian. That really is what Luke is, is declaring in both Luke and Acts. That's the purpose statement he himself gives in Luke 1.4. So, why four Gospels? Now, think about it. Every person on the earth in the first century to every person on the earth in the 21st century finds themselves in one of these four categories. You're either a Jewish believer or 
unbeliever or a Gentile believer or unbeliever. Literally, you see, when you put the four Gospels together, you have Gospels for everybody. No one's left out. Now, every Gospel is true, and every Gospel is vital, and every Gospel is important. Every Gospel should be read. Every Gospel should be understood. Every Gospel should be taken to heart by everyone who hears but you're going to find out uniquely. I mean, if you're, just, if you're just living in London, just an unbeliever. In fact, it's very interesting that Christianity Explored uses which gospel to confront Gentiles with Jesus Christ? The gospel of Mark. They didn't ask me. I said they just did it. But it is. It's... It is, it is the gospel that confronts the Gentile mind. Just as John confronts the Jewish mind. If, you, if you're invited this week to go into a Jewish synagogue and uh, talk about some, something from Scripture, use John. You might get thrown out, but uh, I mean, <laughs> but uh, they'll particularly, they'll, they'll know what you're saying. They'll either believe or they'll throw you out. You got a good present. They did the same thing with Paul. They'll do the same thing with you. They'll understand, and again, you'll either have revival or you'll have rebellion, all right? But uh, it, 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 will, it will not remain neutral in that environment, all right? And then for, you know, Jewish believers and today, with as many Messianic communities I know in the, U, in the UK as well as US and uh, even into to Israel, and their favorite gospel is Matthew. And, uh, and because we are Pauline, uh, particularly, we, we sense a kinship to uh, the gospel of Luke. It gives great assurance to us as Gentile Christians. Now, all I've done, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, just a quick overview of how the gospels fit together. And right there, if you want to know how they all fit together, Dr. MacArthur's One Perfect Life. Now, there's two ways of going about harmonizing uh, Thomas and Gundry and Harmony the Gospels, what they do is they, they set out in columns the Gospels so that uh, if, uh, if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John like uh, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, they all speak about in each column they're, gonna, they're going to put on the same page the same event so you can look and you can compare and contrast. Uh, Dr. MacArthur, what he's done is basically compared and contrasted for you and put it together into one uh, you know, one whole. So um, both are, are, are valuable uh, tools, but uh, what I would encourage you is read the four Gospels, study the four, four Gospels individually first, and then you'll find uh, these uh, harmonies for further study will, uh, will be very, very valuable to help you start to put together the whole as far as the flow of the life of Christ is concerned. All right, in our last 10 minutes, let's introduce ourselves to the Gospel of Matthew. Interesting facts about the Gospel of Matthew. Favorite Gospel of the early church. One of the two Gospels written directly by one of Christ's apostles, the other being John. The major connecting link between the Old Testament and New Testament. Could you start that? Matthew, in many ways, is the most important book ever written, to quote from uh, Ernest Renan. And why is it the most important book? Because it is the major link between the two Testaments. The better you understand Matthew, the better you'll understand the New Testament. Let me go even a step further. The better you understand Matthew, the better you understand the Old Testament. And interestingly, in the promise of God, Matthew is the most heard, read, studied, and preached book of the New Testament throughout the history of the church. Um, some of you here grew up in the Anglican tradition. Every Sunday you got up and uh, recited the Lord's Prayer. From where? Matthew 6. 
Matthew is, again, more used in church liturgy from those in liturgical tradition than any other part of the New Testament. You hear Matthew more in church services even today than any other book in the New Testament. Now, I think the Holy Spirit has a reason for that. So, if it's the most heard, read, study preached, maybe it might be valuable for you to read it. It is, as I said, the most important book ever written. Now, the most important book is the Bible as a whole. And don't play favorites. Don't have a canon within a canon. I'm a Matthew guy. I don't read the rest. All right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's not being a good steward of what God has given to you. All right? So we are, we are people of one book. And all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is to, is to build into our lives. But that doesn't mean that we are not also appreciative of the fact that, uh, that there are certain parts of Scripture that are key to helping us understand the whole better. All right, so basic facts concerning the Gospel of Matthew. The author, according to the first uh, church, early church father, was Matthew. And the first audience was first-generation Christian Jews dispersed from Jerusalem. I believe it was written while Matthew was still in Jerusalem, Acts 8 to 12. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem, and, uh, and the disciples were scattered, which probably meant it was written somewhere between about 35 to 44, although it could have been written as late as uh, 50. Early church tradition seems to imply there were versions in both Aramaic and Greek, though only the Greek version has survived, sometimes known as the uh, Hebrew gospel. And the early church fathers located Matthew's writing in Palestine. He was in Palestine writing to Jewish Christians who had gone back to different parts of the Roman Empire where they had grown up. By the way, at the time of the Roman Empire, over 80% of the Jews lived outside of Palestine. And why? Why did Matthew write? He wrote to supply proof that Jesus was the Messiah predicted in the Old Testament. Although Israel had rejected his messianic claims and turned him over to Rome to be crucified, Jesus had been raised from the dead and one day will return to the earth to establish God's kingdom. All right, let's think quickly of Matthew at this point. Matthew 1 and 2. Matthew 1 and 2 is all about Jesus being Messiah. The first 17 verses of Matthew 1, the genealogy. The genealogy proves that Jesus was the son of Abraham, the son of David. He was a true Jew, true heir of David. In fact... If David's throne would have been set up in his generation, he had the legal title to it because he was the legally recognized son of Joseph. That's what the genealogy establishes. You have a Davidic king in Jesus' day. It's Jesus. He's the firstborn of Joseph. Not only that, verses 18 to 25, he's also the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. He's the only virgin conceived, virgin born Son. And by the way, notice 125. Mary was still a virgin when she gave birth. It wasn't just a virgin conception, it was a virgin giving birth. And his name was Jesus. He was born in the right place. 2 6. In Bethlehem. Even the unbelieving scribes. We're able to point that out to Herod. He's the typological fulfillment of Hosea 11.1, 1, being taken to Egypt. He reduplicates Israel. And just as God's son Israel was taken out of Egypt, so was God's son Messiah taken out of Israel as well. 
And just as there was a calamity that, uh, that took place with the weeping uh, when Israel was taken into exile, there was weeping that took place when Jesus was taken into exile, into Egypt. And ultimately, he comes back not to Bethlehem, but grows up in Nazareth, that he might be called a Nazarene. Nazareth was never mentioned in the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, it had a very unsavory reputation because Gentiles were all around it. Messiah can't come from Galilee. Messiah can't come from Nazareth. He did. He was called a Nazarene. This fulfills the, the prophets, plural, that he'll be despised, rejected. He'll be a Nazarene. And so, in the first two chapters, Jesus has made it very, very clear that, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Now, he continues to echo this, obviously, as you go through the, the whole gospel of, uh, of Mark. I'm sorry, of Matthew. See, I'm thinking of Dr. Harris. Mark. Matthew. And, uh, and it is significant. You come to the very end, chapter 28, And in verse 16, okay, the, the king was crucified, but he's raised and again. The 11 disciples go to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and there they saw him and worshipped him. But some doubted. Is he, really, is he really raised? But he was. And they worshipped him. And by the way, worship goes to God. And then Jesus gave them his uh, commission, saying at the end, behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. You see, in chapter 1, he comes as the fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. He is God with us. And even in his ascension, even though he's not physically with the disciples, he is still God with us. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, since the disciples have died, that's a promise not just for the disciples, but for those who would believe through the disciples' message. He's still God with us to this day. You see, Jesus was and continues to be the Messiah. He's God with us. So, uh, Matthew supplies these and many other proofs that Jesus was Messiah predicted in the Old Testament. And then tomorrow night we'll have to pick it up with, and Messiah comes to Israel, and what was Israel's response? Well, we've already seen it. Israel's response is one of rejection. And you see this essential, you know, working out of this basic theme in the Gospels uh, begins in Matthew. So we'll pick it up tomorrow night with the essential themes of, uh, of Matthew and uh, walk quickly through Matthew. Now, I don't feel bad walking quickly through Mark because some of you are getting that anyway. <laughs>